Okay. Well, I wanted to welcome everybody to our second season of online poetry, The Refuge of Witnessing. Um, this program runs weekly. It's a poetry sanctuary to hear moving words, deepening our exploration of their meaning and connect with each other. Um, it will be your port in a worldly storm. And today, featuring um, Dane Servine, and he is coming to uh, join us from California and has a very extensive bio um, and lots of new books. Um, but I think the best way to get to know him is to join us and enjoy this program. I'll turn it over to John Gillespie, who is now hosting. Great. Thank you. No, thanks a lot, Maria. Uh, you're going to let some people, there are people wanting to come in? Uh, at the moment, it's just the three of us, but I think um, it just turned 12, so hopefully more will come in. Yeah. So, you know, Dane, we could start just because I, I want to, you know, get the full time. So <clears throat> how does how does refuge, you know, and I, and I, I think you told me you're, you're I guess your son and his family are living with you now for a while while they do some construction. So, I don't know to me that 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 makes the uh, the refuge, you know, very 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 positive in terms of family connection. But you yeah. know, where where does refuge fit in your life as a concept? Well, you you mentioned it's actually my daughter. Oh, who, your daughter, who is um, with her, um, you know, firstborn Wyatt, my my grandson, and her husband. Tyler and their two dogs, Stella and Bandit, <laughs> have um, temporarily moved in. I have this little writing studio here, so they're literally next door to me as they try and sell their house in Prunedale, which is a community um, south of Watsonville and north of Monterey. Um, and so suddenly our home as um, I have to say, as a grandparent, is delightfully full. Um, you know, my wife and I were kind of like, oh, empty nesters and settling into retirement, doing our various creative projects. And now our nest is very full. But um, it's, like you said, it's a different kind of refuge with family. And, you know, often we, I'll, I'll have again, you know, we may have kids living elsewhere or across the country. But at the moment, um, you know, my my son, who's a, also a poet, uh, lives in town with his um, girlfriend Olivia, and she's a potter. And I just visited her immense pottery studio right behind their apartment complex. You know, filled with art and music, and <clears throat> so. And my daughter teaches history just uh, down the road here. So for me, during the pandemic. Um, it's had these different seasons of just my wife and I, you know, sheltering yeah, yeah. at home and then family and providing refuge for them um, during some of these transitions. So it's been full and sweet. Nice, nice. <clears throat> so I, I think I mentioned this when we talked, <clears throat> you know, last week, you know, the 12 o'clock hour lunch hour on the East Coast you know, people are busy, you know, a year ago, everyone was home. Now everyone's out doing things or trying to do things. And it's also the holiday season. So yeah. my apologies for it being a very, very intimate uh, reading, but. Uh, well, that's get... fine. I appreciate the, the recording of it because a lot of my West Coast, um, <clears throat> you know, folks are just waking up and they love being able to watch it on, on video on YouTube later. Oh yeah, and we do get we get we probably get five or ten times more views on YouTube just when people try to fit it into their schedule. Yeah. So you know, so it's great that you know, I think you 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 just talked about how family fits into the refuge concept. How does that or does it that refuge concept show up in some of your poetry? Well, I think you know the the act of writing and the act of poetry itself is a, you know, as most writers find, I think a tremendous refuge in itself to be able to turn inward where there are immense worlds, you know, of history and memory and thoughts. Um, but certainly in, in some of my poems themselves, and I, you know, I have a number of them where 
themes of where to go for refuge um, do emerge. I, I have yeah. a particular interest in the history of utopian societies. You know, I'm a child who came up in the 60s and 70s yeah. and um, was always looking for that place to retreat to. And I think my parents were too, because, you know, in the back of my new book is a little history of my parents buying 38 acres of land up near Yosemite and my siblings and I and friends would all go up there and my dad built um, what he called the village of Shangri-La. It was a series of little hexagons that were, he was inspired um, during his time, interestingly enough, four years he spent in Japan during the Korean War and he came back and just felt as a part of the 70s in that time period, yeah. com compelled to build a little retreat or refuge, which he did. And, um, you know, we, for a while there, you know, in that typical era, you know, all my graduate school friends from San Francisco, and we were studying psychology and religious studies, we'd go up on weekends and we'd do workshops and but then yeah. they, they turned it into a bed and breakfast um, because there was a lot of intrepid travelers up to Yosemite. Yeah. And so they would go there and lots of Christmases and Thanksgiving. Yeah. So that's, right. That was a, a essential place of retreat for, for me and for my family members. Very tangible in the mountains. And does your family still own it? Well, we do. And that's the flip side for me of witnessing um, what's going on in the world. Um, you know, my dad died in 2002 and my mom continued living, um, you know, a mile up this dirt road, you know, well into her seventies, but she just finally came to live with us and passed away uh, last year. So my siblings and I, we still own the property, but the entire Sierra Nevadas have lost um, thousands and thousands of trees due to the bark beetle and the drought. And so as an example of what refuge, you know, encounters, we feel like we're on the very edge of climate change at our own property. Yeah. Um, you know, it was once <clears throat> a forest and now it's more like a savanna. You know, there's most of the pine and cedar trees are, are gone and it's, there's a lot of grief associated with that. Like, where did our refuge go? You know, it's not the same anymore. Yeah. And still we have these weird moments as we've gotten the trees cleared of, oh, now we can see the sunset on the ridge um, across the way, which we never yeah. used to be able to see before. <laughs> um, the Ferguson fire that came out of Yosemite about yeah. three or so years ago broke through six fire breaks and ended at the final fire break right at the top of our ridge. And so we were at risk of losing, you know, the entire yeah. property. Wow. So we have this mixed feeling of where is a safe place on the planet, you know, these days, where is refuge? And it seems to have more of this mixed, <clears throat> you know, mixed feeling of vulnerability and gratitude for places of retreat. So that's, it's quite been quite the story. Yeah, and uh, I left, I grew up in Mass. I left Eastern Mass in 1977 and I uh, went to Chicago, Cincinnati, Pennsylvania, Jersey, stuck in Jersey for 20 years, DC, hmm. Stockbridge, Mass. And, uh, but every time I go back <clears throat> to Newton, Mass to look, to, to drive by a place where we used to live or we live somewhere else, it just kind of opens up this, this, nostalgia aroma or i don't know it's not even aroma it's like it's almost like something just mm. washes over me and all these memories just come yeah <laughs> come trickling down from my brain I'm like hey mm. remember when i rode the bike with the baseball card in the spokes when mm. bill mazeroski hit the home run in 1960 you know all, all these all these you know things that i think about probably ever you know once every 10 years but mm. if i'm there they, it's it's like one of those uh, all the files download at the same all time. All the files download, yeah. And I think for you know as writers and and poets, that's uh, 
an amazing process how much is layered inside of our consciousness and um thank god it it you know gets triggered and evoked by travel like you described or things in the world and we suddenly have access to vast reservoirs of experiences that you know maybe most people going about their day don't necessarily have the time to think about or to feel and so i think writing does that for us yeah and i think the you know the, the reason you know i picked refuge but also witnessing as as a theme is that since i've moved to maine it's all new so i feel like i'm much more in observation mode and i'm also witnessing and you know is your your grandson is it grandson why yeah yeah why is yeah i'm witnessing you know this three-year-old or three and a half year old human being and completely forgetting what my kids basically did <laughs> i'm like it's so in awe of this i'm like i go to my daughter did you do that she goes yeah dad i did that <laughs> so i i think part of it is you know for me is witnessing has so many aspects but i think mm. there's a a joy of being present in the moment yeah to witness and appreciate things in life rather mm. than you know at times you just kind of i think people just rush through stuff and then yeah you wonder where the whole day went yeah well that's the power of poetry in particular for me is like you said these crystal clear moments that um you might normally pass by but as a poet you have to have a certain contemplative witnessing aspect to your way of being in the world um and these little jewels are just lying everywhere you know waiting to be discovered i i had one with my daughter the other day because she and i both had one of these moments where you know she was remembering a um she was nursing Wyatt in the very same chair, rocking chair, that my wife had nursed her in, and we still have it. And there was this continuity between the generations. And she looked at me and I looked at her and, you know, she put up with me writing a lot of poems about them yeah. when we were growing up. But it provided this... Um, you know, just as you can imagine, one of those magical moments of the generations passing and her sitting in that yeah, same seat yeah. as the mother now. And, and yeah, my, the, yeah, that witnessing that, the, uh, well, I, I wouldn't call it witnessing. Yeah, the, what, what's the saying? Uh, I don't know, the, the Celts have it, you know, like there's a thin layer, there's a thin layer between mm. you know, what, one world and the next. And mm -hmm. you can, and I think part of it is, you know, those connections that what you just experienced there, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's just, to me, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. As part of it, it, it just happens. Mm -hmm. And all this, it just, you know, it's almost, I call it like the Alka-Seltzer effect. It all bubbles up and then eventually it quiets down. But um, so is there a poem or two you'd want to just read right now to? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. You know, I, I'm going to be reading a few poems. I have some different poems later, but, you know, this is from my uh, latest book, The World is God's Language. It was just published this year by 16 Rivers Press. And the uh, title comes from a Simone Weil quote. Um, you know, she was that French activist and mystic yeah. um, who believed very much that attention itself is a form of prayer. Um, and this is a book of um, a collection of my prose poems. So they're just these tiny little paragraphs. Yeah, nice. My mentor was Gary Young in this regard. So uh, this poem is called uh, Growing Old, and it's kind of set in Santa Cruz in one place that I find refuge in, yeah. Growing Old. Redwood Grove in the Coastal Range. Two prodigious elders fused into a single trunk, burned hollow at the base from some disaster. Yet the tree still grows. 
Blackened redwood walls rise, a ruined cathedral, room enough for our small band to wander in, succumb to awe. I can feel how it happens, growing old around the burn, room now to shelter, sun drawing you where you want to go. Mm. Yeah, I forget how big I forget how big the redwoods are, right? They're big. <laughs> and some of these, you know, this this was a particular tree that were two that had fused into oh, one. Right now. And a fire literally had burned a cathedral size core, a small cathedral, yeah, out yeah. of the center of it that you could wander around in. Wow. And look up at the sun coming down. Um, so the forest, you know, here has some of those places. Um, nice, nice, yeah. nice. Um, you know, maybe just a, a, a second one on that theme. This is going back in history. Um, it's called Rainbow Gathering. And I don't, I don't know if you've ever encountered this crew. This was right 1985 when I graduated in psychology from graduate <laughs> school. And my brother who was um, kind of a, at the time a guitar playing hippie not that I wasn't, but um, said, come on, we got to get out of graduate school. Let's go to the Rainbow Gathering. It's up in Modoc County on the border of Nevada. And this is a, you know, crew of folks who would go from state to state and hold yeah. these astonishing festivals, yeah. Yeah. well organized. So this was one of my, you know, um, kind of little rituals of yeah. movement. Um, yeah. So Rainbow Gathering. After graduate school, my brother took me to a remote corner of Nevada where we pitched our tent next to a pair of rainbow women, nude except for a feather here, a crystal there, democratic latrine pits in the open air, no one able to hide their shit, food for the asking, mushrooms, spirits, after, not a shred of garbage left anywhere. But it was the circle at dusk, a mile wide circumference of people chanting Om that still haunts. How at the edge of the meadow, the plateau plummeted far down toward a town below. I live with this memory like a ghost limb. And that's, you know, I, I think many of us have a, a sense of being haunted, you know, by whether it's all the way back to some primeval garden of Eden or some uh, memory of home with parents or one's hometown. Yeah. Like my wife always has such an attachment to Madison, Indiana, which I've now formed an attachment to as, as the hometown she grew up in on the Ohio River. Um, and we can be haunted by this place of sheltering or home that we're drawn back to. But this was one for me um, that uh, ushered me into my adult life and kept me ever thinking about community and family and, and what's possible in the world. Well, I'd say, thinking about Indiana, I lived in Chicago for two years from 77 to 79. And hmm. I don't know if there was a song on the radio Gary, Indiana, da 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 da. No, and every every <laughs> every week or so, because it's just one of those, like Boston, the dirty water, the Charles River. There's the, these thematic geography songs mm. that just somehow no disc jockey in the right mind would keep playing, mm -hmm. but they keep showing up on the airwaves. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, Gary, Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. As another quick aside, if folks are ever driving through Madison, Indiana, which is um, just an hour um, out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, there's a bookstore that is one of my personal places of retreat called Village Lights Bookstore. Yeah. And it was begun, um, modeled on the City Lights books in San Francisco. And this uh, marvelous um, couple, um, he's a Zen practitioner also have, you know, cats and rocking chairs and more books than you can imagine in this old Victorian. 
And that's when, whenever we go to visit my, my wife's hometown, we spend a lot of time at Village Lights Books. Nice, nice. Yeah, we lived in Cincinnati also, so. Oh. We did the, yeah. We got some great yeah. museums. Yeah. Uh, you know what Mark Twain said about Cincinnati? If the world ended, it wouldn't happen until five years later in Cincinnati. <laughs> that's how progressive it was. The, the, the and I'll to tell you one more thing, we'll get back to the themes. Yeah. Uh, when we moved there in 1979, just a couple of weeks after we got married, they had more chili places than McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy in total. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, it's like the chili capital. There, there was chili oh. in the grocery store. There was chili at a drugstore. There was chili, chili on every menu. It's like clam chowder out here. Mm. And we were not used to it. We were like, mm. you know, what's this stuff with chili? Yeah, just mm. no, <laughs> Cincinnati was a yeah, mm. funny place. Mm. So um, <clears throat> you're, I know you do a lot. Uh, is, is it with a writing group? There's some group you're involved with? So. Yes. Well, I have, I have a couple of primary groups. One in Santa Cruz is the Emerald Street Writers. Um, we yeah. call ourselves that just because literally 20 years ago, we started meeting at a home on Emerald Street and it kind yeah. of stuck. So we, um, we've put a, a couple of our own and Anthologies. We've had an ongoing cast of characters kind of come and go, but a core of us have been there for 20 years. We meet every other week and we used to rotate, you know, between each other's homes. And now for better and worse, you know, we, we meet via Zoom, which has brought in some of our yeah. members who had left and we're now able to participate. So every two weeks to, um, commune together, you know, with hearing each other's work, um, providing some feedback and commentary. Yeah. Um, it's a very sacred and um, robust and hilarious uh, way of gathering with like-minded people and, and producing work. And yeah. more than that, you know, there's readings are obviously marvelous, but to be heard that deeply, from fellow writers in a writer's group every couple of weeks with inquiries about why you said this or how yeah, does yeah. this work is a very intimate affair. And so I've been a big fan of, of writing groups. Um, the second group that I'm now involved with is a collective called the 16 Rivers Press, which has- um, I know, a long list, long list of poets, yeah. Yeah, and kind of spread out through the, um, what I learned was the 16 rivers that all flow into the San Francisco Bay from around California. Um, so we all have, um, help, you know, critique each other's books, help produce, give readings. Um, so I'm, I'm part in, through that group of a larger regional Bay Area yeah. group of poets. Um, and even though, as you can see, this is my little study here. So I spent an awful lot of time as most writers do in isolation, yeah. um, in the privacy of, of you know, writing, but to be a part of, and I really encourage people if they're not a part of a writer's group to start one or you know, find yeah. ways to um, do the communal aspect of witnessing and refuge you know, with each other. So I've been fortunate in that way. Poet, a Santa Cruz for a small community. You know, we're just 90 minutes south of San Francisco and we're a county of about 250,000 people. Santa Cruz itself is just about yeah. 65,000. But we have a very rich poetry community here that wow. I have a lot of gratitude for. Nice. Yeah. I'm not moving there. I'm too, I'm too much of an East Coast guy. <laughs> No, I can't. Yeah, I was toughing up living in Chicago when it was a one hour time difference between, you know, growing up in the East Coast. It's like, I don't know, why is the news on at nine o'clock at night? <laughs> or whatever time it was, it was crazy. So so just in the um, you know, in that that every other, you know, the Emerald Street. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, do some of these, you know, I you know, I think the last 18 months or now it's <laughs> it's coming up on two years you know 
are the, are the themes of, you know, where do you find refuge? Does, has there been a different shift in tone or theme uh, with your every two week group in, in terms of how they're viewing the world or? Yeah, you know what, I think on the, on the theme of witness, we have some interesting discussions about and poems about um, the kind of double-edged sword that witnessing, you know, is on, yeah. on the one hand to witness the world, you know, you know, some of us will watch the news sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And, and we often talk about exposure, you know, when is witnessing edge into a kind of toxic obsession with things going wrong mm. in the world versus having enough contemplative strength and capacity almost in a meditative kind of way yeah. to bear witness to the world but i'm a therapist and i there there's this thing i talk about in the group too about how you know, we're still animals, we're creatures with a triune brain and the amygdala at yeah, the base yeah. of our brain, the reptilian brain, which influences poets also, you know, is really geared primarily towards threat analysis. It's fight or flight. And so in witnessing the world, one of the things we talk about is how to not only expand our poetic capacity to write about and bear witness to the terrible strains in the world, but also to bear witness to joy and yeah. to find a poetics of, you know, refuge, gratitude, celebration. And how does that appear in poems, you know, without being Pollyanna-ish, but also without writing primarily poems of grief and terror about all the things happening. So it's, we have different ones of us in the writer's group, yeah. you know, that, that kind of edge towards one side of that equation or, or the other, but it's the pandemic has specifically brought on more of a focus on what does it mean to bear witness to the world um, in all of its horror and glory. Um, so that's that's I think been an enriching, you know, thing for us. Yeah, yeah. I think the last two years, I feel like whoever's writing this movie script ought to win a couple Oscars for, hey, I got a COVID, I got a recurring COVID, I got Trump, I don't know. I feel, I feel yeah, like, yeah. I feel like this is, you know, you know well, that's the, go ahead, go I, ahead. That's, I think the odd thing, isn't it, about, you know, poems and writing and movies aren't really interesting. They're boring unless a lot of shit happens. Excuse my language. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, and that narrative is driven by grief and surprise and twists and turns. And, and so, like you said, this last couple of years, um, the world's been like a mad screenwriter is going, hey, I've got this, you know, stuff I want to write about. And so there's a way, I think, to <clears throat> not just resist but to embrace as writers the storylines that are evolving and emerging you know inside of ourselves and in the world and resist it less but find it evocative in what it means to be a human being and to live and to write and to do art so i was just thinking about that when you mentioned what what you said about some mad screenwriter <laughs> maybe it's going yeah. a little wild here no, you're right. I think the events, events positive, neutral, and negative, you know, maybe not so much in the middle, you know, do generate reactions and those reactions, you know, turn into, you know, written word or hmm. songwriter songs or, uh, you know, movie themes. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's, you're right. It's the, it's the fuel. It's the fuel that, that, uh, Listen, it creates conversations. It creates mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, there was a, you know, you may have heard about it on the West Coast. So, you know, those floods in Washington State mm -hmm. and how they, 
you know, so bad that on a dairy farm, it killed a bunch of cows that got caught in the water. Mm. And, you know, here we're not in the flood area. So it's, it's, it's like hearing about a distant world that's mm. not in our world. You know, it's mm. almost like we're, you know, Steven Spielberg, I don't know, we're, we're looking out into some future world. Wait a second. Why can't the cows swim in that world? You know, it just I'm not I'm not trying to make the little of it because I, mm -hmm. I I was very teary eyed when I read it because mm -hmm. I felt so sad for those animals. Mm -hmm. But it's just I don't know. They're just it's just so much stuff that happens. Yeah. I'm just wondering, does the is there a time when the container just gets too big? There's mm -hmm. like too much stuff, mm -hmm. and you know. I, I don't know. I'm not going to say nuclear yeah. warfare, but yeah. it's just like this. Almost like there's almost like too much fuel in the fire. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I, part of our writers group discussions obviously range over all the implications of that. So for me, hearing that, you know, as an example, it's like, and particularly as a therapist too, my clients yeah. will complain about the 24/7 exposure via the news to things going on in remote places around the world and like you said it, it can both overwhelm you in a way that societies have not been overwhelmed before no one's been exposed to the vast stage of the world like we are daily but on the other hand it can seem surreal like those cows what you know distant places and so there's kind of a push pull with that. But one of my strategies, I do, I love reading a lot of history and my daughter is a history buff. And, and um, so I have a couple of books, you know, up here because I'm a Zen practitioner of reading a lot of Chinese um, history yep, yep. and philosophy and watching them go through such immense time periods of trauma and glory um, you know, they had a, a period where China lost um, two, thir two thirds of its population due to war and um, illness. And, and then when I, so it's like, we're not alone. Sometimes I yeah. think, you know, as baby boomers or in America, we're like, you know, it's all about us, you know, because life was supposed to be okay, or yeah. we had solved all those problems. <laughs> And I'm having a certain kind of humility through reading about realizing, oh, we're not alone in this. There, there have been many um, episodes of <sighs> turmoil and glory. And that's part of the nature of the world, what my Zen teacher, John Tarrant calls the beast of the world. He's from Tasmania, yeah. just below Australia. And he's like, oh yeah, the world's, the world's a beast. You know, it's only, you know, some of us just, you know, in the baby boomer group thought, well, we were going to take care of all that, but the world's a little wild. And I was thinking about that too. I just wanted to mention, you know, there's a couple of great interviews with Robin Costa Lewis. I don't know that. She um, is the LA Los Angeles Poet Laureate, and she won the National Book Award for her What's first called? book. Voyage, Voyage of the Sable a Voyage Venus. Voyage of the Sable Venus. Um, it's a it's a poetic um, kind of review of the figure of the the sable Venus or the black figure that has occurred in these strange ways through history. But what I was struck by in an interview with her in Rattle magazine was that uh, she's a history buff too. She says, "You know, I'm only interested in millennia." She says, give me 50,000 years back or, or 100,000 years back and I'm interested. So she, she's a Sanskrit scholar. Yeah. She studies mythology from around the world. <sighs> and in hearing her um, interview as, from a poet that interested in those spans of time um, was somehow really heartening to me because I think with our personal poetry that we do that roots us in the moment with such glaring presence, which I think is wonderful. Um, but there's something liberating about knowing the larger spans of yeah. 
history on the earth. And so I take refuge in that. Uh, you know, the Buddhists have this idea of taking refuge. You take yeah. refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, yeah. which is community. And so for me, there's a way as a poet of taking refuge in the world itself and the larger evolution and spans of time that I find very heartening. Nice. So when you're talking before, like, you know, I think we, since we're both pretty much the same age, you know, when we grew up, you know, the American dream was going to be all right. Everything was going to be okay. And, and once that again, was, that was some famous script. You know, once again, if the script writers were up in heaven, they're, they're always writing some good ones because, you know, I'm not sure what we re really resolved. I'm not sure what problems we really solved mm -hmm. you know, besides cars going faster or, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like, I feel like what we've been good at is continuously creating drama around so many things. And maybe this is the, this is the poetic engine, the drama yeah. thing, the drama, the drama beast has to get fed. Yeah. You have to feed the beast mm. or you're, yeah. uh, no, nah, it's, it's, well, it's, it's disheartening. I, I, I know we're kind of emoting here, but I, I know, I don't have no idea how our kids are going to negotiate things 30 mm. years from now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll probably be some, you know, metaverse thing you wear on your eye. I don't know. It's too crazy. Virtual world. Yeah, yeah, don't look at the real world. Look at the world That's... I'm digitizing for you. Maybe there'll be a whole new genre of virtu virtual poetics that our kids. That's will. it. Yeah, that's it. So are there some additional things you'd like to read for us? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. Um, from this same book, I thought I would read one. Speaking of, um, you know, refuge and my mother. Yeah. So this was, this poem is called World Yoga. And it's just a little snapshot of her after my father died and yeah. before she came to live with us in Santa Cruz. And she would just do her thing kind of um, up in the mountains, world yoga. Yeah. Yoga in the outdoor pagoda hexagon with my 80 year old mother. The thin summer screen decorated with orange and green butterflies keeps the bugs out, still lets the world in. A smiling stone Buddha watches every move. Six gunshots echo from a rifle in the hills. A hunter stalking squirrels, birds, even deer. My mother doesn't mind. Death, she says, is just another way the world moves. I felt very, um, had a lot of gratitude for my um, <clears throat> mother because after a career as a high school teacher and my, my father too, she yeah. found refuge, so to speak, not only in building you know, these hexagons and this hexagon yeah. I reference here is one yeah. um, that um, they were building that had a screened in porch and yeah. it had this sense of a membrane, yeah. you know, protecting you from the world, yeah. But letting the world in. Yeah. And she ran a, a metaphysical book and gift store in downtown Mariposa for about 20 years after she yeah. retired, which was definitely a place of refuge for um, people who would just come and hang out and yeah. um, do workshops. And um, so, but I, I was, my mom was a great teacher. She, she was like doing yoga up in the mountains, not worried about the hunters, you know, roaming the hills. Her own husband had died. Um, and I learned a lot from her about just the cycles of life and um, how to be in that place of permeable boundary with the world, letting some yeah. things in, keeping some things out. So. Yeah, I think in hindsight, if I could have my magic wand, I'd probably, you know, may, maybe uh, you know, lower the brick wall sometimes to let more wisdom come in, especially thinking from, because when I grew up, maybe I shared this with you, you know, we, I live with aunts, uncles, grandmothers. Mm. This is kind of like a boarding house experience. Mm. There wasn't mm. a time until I was, 
it had to be like 25. Hmm. Where I didn't live with another person that wasn't part of our family, but was a cousin in the house. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There was always, there was always, <laughs> there was always another party. I felt like, hmm. you know, they, I was just wondering, <laughs> and all the kids I grew up with never had that experience. So they, you know, it's almost like, I don't know, why don't they have other people in the house? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have all these but, things. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you're describing what people used to primarily live in that kind of extended family and yeah. aunts and uncles and grandkids. Yeah. 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 So just tell me, you know, as I know you you're you're a Zen practitioner and you're you're it's always mentioned in your bio and stuff. So how does that hmm. Or does it show up? It must mm. show up in your poems in a bunch of different mm. uh, places. And I, I'm sure it is, and I'm, I'm not calling it out the right way, but. Yeah. Well, the, the confluence for me is so clear between you know, Zen meditation kind of riveting you to the moment. And yeah, as yeah. a poet, you're riveted to the moment yeah. in order to bring something forth. But yeah. when, I, when I say I'm a Zen, practitioner it's with a you know it's not the usual thing you picture with a shaved head and the robes and you know that's a very traditional um kind of um zen approach that's still very active you know yeah. across the country but um the group i study with is the pacific zen institute um in santa rosa and john tarrant um is the uh, teacher and it's, he's a Jungian therapist also, and he's a poet like me. And he has described for us an ancient tradition in China where Zen was known as Chan, C-H-A-N. Yeah. And there were time periods where Zen and Chan were very integrated with the arts, with haiku, with painting, mm -hmm. with tea ceremony as an expression of um, and not extraneous to practice itself. Yeah. Um, so for me, there's a very natural um, kind of coming together of these contemplative worlds. And um, one thing that was actually kind of fun um, was he, there's a, do you know what a koan is? A, yeah, yeah. And koan, these little enigmatic yeah. phrases or stories that are kind yeah. of contradictory. Yeah. So he challenged me to, as a poet, to write a series of poems, like apparently all the old Chinese dudes used to do, in response to the 48 Zen koans of the Gateless Gate, the Gateless yeah. Gate, very famous 48 yeah. koan collection. And um, I felt a little presumptuous doing that, but it was a part of an integration of my spiritual and creative practice. And then I included at the end some little prose poems, like I'm reading here, based yeah. on Japanese and Chinese folktales. So I'll be damned if I didn't send that off to a small press in Hawaii, Saddle Road Press, that was looking for a cross-genre yeah. kind of work, and they ended up uh, publishing it. So it was a great expression for me of this kind of Pacific Rim, yeah. creative confluence between zen practice and poetics so i had a lot of it was a kind of magical strange you know thing to be involved with but that's one of my previous books you can find on my uh, website yeah no you you've you've been or and are still involved in a lot of interesting things so uh yeah this is about my most interesting thing i think besides family is the poetry hour i feel yeah. like the uh who wrote, who was it? Longfellow wrote the children's hour, that famous poem. Mm, mm. And uh, no, no, the poetry hour is my, my recharge time. It just, it, it gets great. me away from my world of numbers where everything is a number, you know, it's like mm, the matrix. Mm. They're just, they're just they're, they're, they're flying up and down my computer screen. Yeah. You know, and I've got, I've got to sort of pull them and push them into spreadsheets. Yeah. Uh, hmm. So are there a few more things you'd like to read from us? I mean, I know you're reading the yeah. prose stuff. How about the, the book before? Yeah. And once again, you, I, I don't want to, you, you read what you want, but I, I, oh, I know there were some things that you, you read last year that once again, were very evocative. So, but you. Well, you, here's one. So yeah, my previous book uh, from Main Street Rag is Earth 
is a fickle dancer. <laughs> yeah. And again, if you, um, <clears throat> I have a strange name apparently. So if you just Google my name, Dana yeah. Servine, you'll find my website and access yeah. to you know, all, yeah. all this work. Um, but this poem is called, I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's the um, Oneida community. Oh yeah, the Oneida. Were, yeah. they, were they Amish or? No, what but it was, a, it was a similar utopian yeah. group. Um, and I, I love studying cults and utopian groups and yeah. religious studies. I have a background in religious studies, so I'm very interested in that. And um, so this poem came out of that course of study um, yeah. called Oneida Silverware, kind of about moving from- Oh, right, right, yeah, wow. The silverware, right. Oneida Silverware. The utopian community, of Oneida caught the millennial fever sweeping America in the 1840s. They planted fruit trees in upstate New York that like Eden failed to survive. Then making animal traps, these vegetarian perfectionists ironically purged the Northeast of beaver and bear, eventually turning to the silver plate cutlery they became famous for. This fever extended to mating, complex marriage, they called it, with multiple partners, the communal raising of children, the quest to find Eden's bliss alive somewhere, anywhere in this desert of a world. Finally, enduring civil war and the ravages of an all too human heart, like we hippies a century later, they paired up, dropped in, formed a capitalist joint stock company, invested in free public libraries, universal education, care for the poor, left the agrarian huts of utopia for this world, for a simpler love, ironic as the original Eden apple biting into its delicious trouble than setting the rough table with silver. Hmm. Nice. And in, in the histories, it was pretty funny. I guess the, uh, you know, the kids and the grandkids, as they grew up, they took a look at their utopian, you know, parents and kind of went, you know, that's a lot of trouble. I just want to get married and and you know, make some not have not have four wives. So if, yeah, if, okay. Yeah. So there seems uh, to be, you know, they took refuge back in the world, which I thought was really interesting. Um, whereas their parents were trying to take refuge, which I can relate to also in, you know, the forest or in a more utopian um, setting. But that seems to be part of the movement of history too. You know, back and forth between these efforts. Yeah, in, when we lived in Stockbridge, uh, Hancock Shaker Village was a very large uh, shaker. Uh, and now oh. it's kind of a, uh, you know, they've still got the dormitories and, you know, the men were on one side, the women were on the other. They've got the barns and no, it is, it is, it, 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 it's all quite amazing. Well, how it all work for them at that, yeah. that time? I remember in college, I studied alternative religious communities and they made um, a case for that. There's these, you know, several different strategies for changing the world. You know, one yeah. is going off into the mountains to literally do an alternate kind of community like the farm in Tennessee yeah. or like any, any number. But there's also um, watching this like sugar or salt dissolved in water, you know, about how these efforts get integrated back into the community, the world at large, even though you yeah. can't see it, you can taste yeah. it. So I had somebody, you know, kind of say, what, what do you mean when baby boomers feel like we've failed? It's like, can't you taste it? Can't you yeah. look around you and yeah. compare that to the world of the 1950s? Um, and the world is really different. And yeah. that always heartened me a little bit about, well, maybe utopia never arrived, but maybe something else, the real world, yeah. you know, took on a flavor 
um, of some of what those dreams were about. Yeah, that's my my rationalization for. <laughs> yeah, I, you're right. I think there's a what do you call it? It's just kind of you know attracting, repelling. There's this dance in life of of embracing and you know maybe running away, seeking refuge somewhere or mm. somewhere with a group of people. Mm. Uh, no, well you've you've done the you know psychology part, so you probably have you know more a much more understanding into you know the different worlds that people present to you when they are chatting with you i'm sure it's yeah. it's quite intriguing it's very intriguing yeah so we have we have time it's it's uh it's about 10 minutes left you know if you want to read a few more poems yeah. and well, and once I, again thank you so much for oh. uh you know coming back it's it's for me and and i think for our audience when they they look at this again such a treat, such a treat, really. My pleasure. And I love, I love your approach this season of creating dialogue around themes and, and witnessing and refuge just seems so timely. So it's, it's a delight to engage in this way. Yeah, yeah. No, we, I, I think this year I wanted to have a conversation and, and for people to understand, I, I, like everybody else, there's so many dimensions. And you know, last year I felt like, I'm not going to say cardboard cutout, but hey, Dane, tell me about COVID. Okay, then read 20 poems. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And I think part of it is there, there are so many, obviously, you know, parts of your life and nuances and, and insights that we would just never get in a reading. Hmm. We just, they just can't, it's, it's not the, the medium for it. This is, hmm. you know, this is just a, you know, I've heard so many new things here. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't even, I forgot about a night of silverware. I can remember yeah. seeing yeah. that in the store. So hmm. probably a good choice. Go capitalism. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, I thought I'd read just a, a few poems yeah. um, as we have time from anthologies that I like to co-promote. Yeah. Um, so my poems have appeared, you know, in yeah. a variety of anthologies that in particular have some application to social change, social justice, climate. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a lot of work coming out. Talk about witnessing. Yeah. You know. So I'll just some samples. This was quite an amazing one called Veils, Hallows, Halos, and Shackles, that comes um, called International Poetry and the Impression, uh, Oppression and Empowerment of Women by Charles Fishman and yeah. Smite Sahe, who's from India. And so the reason why I wanted to read this one was because it's, um, oops, let's see where I find it. It's a part of the um, idea of witnessing when it's not so easily, oops, I thought I had it right here. Here we go. But it's not so tidy. Yeah. Um, and so they chose a, a poem I had written um, kind of called I Stare at the Headlines, which is what we do every day sometimes. Yeah. Um, just bearing witness. Yeah. So I stare at the headlines. Fanny in Medellin pulls the journalist off the bullet swept street into her kitchen. They crouch on the floor with her children wait for hours till the firing moves away and they can run for it. And you, she says, where you come from, isn't it the same? The Tiananmen mothers in China secretly tally the dead, keep alive the memory of their murdered children. They whisper to the journalist, no one asks questions here. We live in a coma, blinded, by fear and new iPods. Miriam in the Afghan refugee camp, widowed, beaten, teaches the women around her to make clothes, shakes the journalist by the shoulders, says, you have language, you can write, tell them. Last night in my dream, I was speaking and writing and speaking 
and writing till my fingers failed and my tongue hung from the world's hook like a dead fish. Mm. And wow. for me, this, you know, this bore a little bit of the, yeah, as a poet, we try and respond to the world. And sometimes there's only bearing witness yeah. um, to what is occurring. And so this entire um, anthology is just filled with a lot yeah. of very raw and um, powerful um, poems um, about that. On a different, a little different venue um, is this one about climate change. Um, I'll just read one of the two poems that came out. Actually, it's from my latest book too, but this is an amazing anthology called yeah. Ghost Fishing, an eco-justice poetry anthology um, from the University of Georgia, edited by Melissa Tuckey. Yeah. And they chose one of uh, my, my favorite poems that I had written called The Dreams of Antelope. Um, and it has a lot to do with how utterly entwined the nature and the world is. You can't get rid of things so yeah. easily. So The Dreams of Antelope. In Yellowstone, they introduced wolves back into the mountains, which fed again on the antelope which stopped overeating the willow trees. So the birds returned to sing and beavers started making dams again from the fallen branches, resurrecting the marshes. And once more, everything started turning green because a wild predator was allowed back into the dreams of antelope. Mm. I think in our Western mind, every time we try and think of fixing something as opposed to reintroducing something of violence, a predator that we think we should only get rid of when really it and we are even human beings, perhaps as predators are really a part of nature, not apart from it. And it's yeah. all about finding the, <clears throat> the appropriate balance. So read one more and then we have to sign off for today. Okay. So, um, well, I'll, um, I'll end with the, the final anthology that was particularly close to my heart is um, called Fire and Rain. Oh boy. Eco Poetry of California, edited by Lucille Lang Day. Um, and with a foreword by Dana Joya, because it's a collection of poems, you know, about what California has been facing. Yeah. Through fires and drought. And um, this poem is um, entitled The Only Truth I Know. And it's not so much about any particular catastrophe, but more about the sense of apocalypse and the desire to do something about it yeah. Uh, yeah. that creeps up. The only truth I know. I open the door to the outhouse in the Sierras find a Jehovah's Witness watchtower perched on a wooden beam. <laughs> With the forest in front of me, I sit, turn the pages, read of God's plan, the end times. Remember that sense of mission, of surety as a boy, when all I needed to know was in that one black book. It is seductive, here in the wilderness to believe in revelation. The lake speaks to me at night, the granite murmurs, the fire cracks and whistles its prophecies. But the young ranger who speaks reverently of the hungry bear roaming these woods says it had to be put down. It wasn't afraid enough of humans. I am afraid, which is why I love the woods for a moment, forgetting politicians who believe in Armageddon, the ideologues who are happy to oblige, trigger happy cowboys of every ilk staring towards the horizon, 
revelation gleaming in their eyes, fingering destiny, absolute surety. It is a feeling I would give almost anything to regain. Place the pamphlet instead back on its perch, hike back to the lake's edge, remove my clothes, stand naked to the only truth I know, jump into water so cold, so clear. Thank you, ah, John. Thank you. Oh, Dane, what a treat, what a treat. Thank you again for taking the time and our prior conversation being so thoughtful and mm. well, welcome to the grandparent world. It, uh, Thank you. It, it is, it is a amazing adventure. It just never ends. It is. <laughs> yeah. And thank Listen, you. I have to go. It's right one o'clock. Right. Yeah, I've got to sign off. Great. Thanks again. I'll, I'll be in touch. Yep. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.